All right, well, we're at six minutes after the hour here, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome everyone here uh, online. Uh, my name is Ryan Hanley, and I'm a professor of political science at Boston College. And I'm delighted and very honored to be able to lead this evening's conversation, uh, her talk conversation with Professor Robert P. George. Um, professor George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University, and indeed one of America's most prominent intellectuals, uh, a leading exponent of a contemporary natural law ethic rooted in the thought of Aristotle and Aquinas. He's been called by the New York Times, America's, quote, most influential conservative Christian thinker, end quote. Um, in addition to his academic and professional service, Professor George has also served as chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, as a member of the President's Council on Bioethics, and as a presidential appointee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Um, this evening's conversation will touch on Professor George's career as a publicly engaged scholar, as well as a recent essay of his that I know uh, the fellows have had an opportunity to look at. Uh, this essay was co-authored with Ryan Anderson, and I believe was published in last year uh, in 2019 in National Affairs under the title, quote, The Baby and the Bathwater. Uh, as far as uh, our proceedings over the next hour go, um, in the first half of the conversation, I'll simply pose a few questions myself to Professor George. Uh, and next we're gonna hear from um, four political studies fellows who have submitted advanced questions for Professor George. I'm very glad to have had a chance to see these myself. They're excellent. And I want to do uh, move to their questions as quickly as possible. Um, we'll then take questions from the wider audience on the call, uh, and you can submit your own questions via Zoom's Q&A function. So if your question is ultimately selected, you'll be recognized to ask your question, but there's no need to wait, and you're welcome to begin submitting your questions using the chat function now. And you'll see that Sydney has just posted a note and instructions on how to do so in the chat box. Um, but with that, let me first take the opportunity to uh, welcome Professor George. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. Well, I'm very grateful to be here, uh, Professor Hanley. It's an honor and delighted to be in a conversation with you. My uh, relationship with the foundation goes back a long way, and I'm very grateful to everyone, uh, everyone there for the great work that you do and the many opportunities I've had to uh, participate in that work. Great. Uh, I share your enthusiasm teaching the students this summer in one of the programs. It's really a, a delight and a pleasure to be part of it. And indeed, with our students, who really are the majority of our audience here on this call, our entire audience, um, let me ask a couple of questions, if I may, just starting out thinking about where they are and some of the things that might be on their mind uh, uh, professionally. Um, and if you don't mind, I'd like to begin with a question about your early studies. Um, I saw in a recent, relatively recent interview, I think that you did with the uh, Abigail Adams Institute, talking about some of your uh, uh, early work. Um, you said that the book that put you on the path to becoming a scholar uh, and a teacher was Plato's Gorgias. And uh, at least some of the Hertog students in political studies this summer, some of them have just spent the first part of their program themselves reading the Gorgias. And I wonder if you could say a few words about uh, what was it about the book uh, that inspired you so much? What did you take away from it? And I wonder um, uh, what you might hope that the students that are reading it now in today's day and age might take away from it as well. Well, Professor Hanley, thanks so much for asking me that particular question as the uh, opener. There's nothing I'm more delighted to uh, talk about. And I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that uh, some of the students are actually reading Gorgias uh, themselves. Now, I don't want to uh, influence their uh, reading. Uh, when I myself teach Plato, as I often do with my uh, pal and teaching partner, Cornell West, we don't even allow secondary sources. We want the student to engage Plato straight on. No one else explaining what Plato uh, is supposed to mean. Uh, but I will say a few words uh, about my own experience because it was the transformative intellectual experience uh, of my life. To do that, I'll have to give uh, everyone just a bit of background uh, about myself. Uh, I grew up in uh, the hills of West Virginia, right in the heart of Appalachia. Both my grandfathers were uh, coal miners. Uh, my father was saved from the mines by the Second World War. He was drafted uh, while still in high school, actually, before he'd even completed high school. His parents eventually got a diploma sent to them while he was over in uh, France, uh, fighting in Normandy and, and Brittany. Uh, but uh, although the, the war 
um, saved him from the coal mines. Uh, he uh, didn't have the money or background to get a college education. So he and my mother, and she was not college educated either, very much wanted uh, college educations, as much education as possible for their five children, all boys. It was a rambunctious bunch of us there in the hills of West Virginia, hunting and fishing and playing bluegrass music and so forth. Now, like lots of uh, families that resembled uh, my own, uh, our parents did want education that was very important for the children, for the boys in this case. But my parents didn't have a very good idea what that actually meant. Uh, they didn't know what a good university was and what a bad university was. Uh, they just wanted their sons to go to universities and to, for them to be good uh, universities. And their main goal in that, and of course this is what we picked up uh, growing up, was the point of an education is to enable you to rise in the world to uh, get a better job, perhaps a professional job, uh, to um, have a better income, uh, to go up the socioeconomic ladder, to be a person of higher social status, uh, perhaps even influence, perhaps even exercising some, uh, some power in politics or in the professions or uh, in business or, or, or what have you. Uh, they were ambitious for their children, as many parents are in, in that way. And that was what I thought I was going after when I arrived as an undergraduate, um, shoeless, uh, a banjo on my back. Um, the, the, the first of those I mean, liter uh, I mean figuratively. <laughs> uh, the second is literal, the banjo literally was on my back. Uh, when I arrived at Swarthmore uh, College, a highly, in those days, intellectually oriented small college. Uh, lots of kids were sons and daughters of professors. Many of them w were destined for the professoriate themselves. Um, so that's, that's where I was. Uh, and I, I wanted to learn and I wanted to do well. But again, in the background of all that was the sense that learning and doing well is something you want to do in order to get ahead, to rise in the world. Now, I don't disdain that to this day. I, I think that, that seeking um, uh, social advancement, economic advancement from your education is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, but it should be secondary. And that's what I learned as a sophomore in an ordinary survey course in political theory, taught by a perfectly good professor, but it wasn't a special course. It was just, we started with Plato and went all the way up to John Rawls. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I was taking it. Uh, I didn't have any particular interest in political theory. It might have been a course requirement or something. I can't remember, a, um, a, a requirement of my program or something. I don't really remember it. Um, but in that course, we were assigned Plato's Gorgias. Now, the students who are reading it know what that's about. Uh, there, uh, Socrates is interacting, as he always does with the sophists. Uh, and Gorgias is not a bad sophist. I mean, a sophist goes, a pretty good one. You know, he's not, he's not a bad guy. He's not malicious. Uh, he's, just, he's just trying to make a living teaching the sons of wealthy Athenians uh, how to do well speaking so that they can be important people in the public square so they can take their place you know among uh, the elite uh, by the power of their rhetoric their ability to speak well and they can be uh, people of standing and influence in the community now of course what plato teaches us in the interaction that socrates has with the uh, first with with gorgias himself and then with the other uh, interlocutors the other sophists is that Truth is not something fundamentally of instrumental value. Fundamentally, truth is something we seek for its inherent or intrinsic value. That truth-seeking, knowledge-seeking, debating, arguing, discussing, engaging in discourse have their real justifications and ultimate significance and importance in trying to get at the truth of the matter. So you're actually better off losing an argument, even if it costs you face, even if it's embarrassing and humiliating, better off losing an argument when you're wrong than winning it because of the power of your rhetoric or your skill in, in oratory. Uh, because what you really should want is to be or get closer to 
be in touch with the, the, the truth. Well, no one had ever proposed that as a possibility to me before. I'd never heard about that. Maybe kids from fancier backgrounds were taught that at Groton or Andover, I don't know. But I had never heard it before. And it was like the light bulb went off over my head. And suddenly something that had been at best, Ryan, utterly obscure, was as clear as day. And suddenly I realized this means everything. This changes everything. That my goal in life shouldn't be, or primarily be, having more money and more status and more influence and power, uh, all of which were things that, again, I, 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 to this day, don't disdain if they're used for good purposes. But they shouldn't be what really drives me. What I was doing, actually, I now see, was discerning my vocation. It didn't, it, that didn't happen in a flash. That took, took some time. But what happened in a flash is I could suddenly see the point of knowledge seeking for its own sake and of truth being paramount. And that put me on the path to my vocation as a scholar and as a teacher, someone whose goal, whose aim is to get at the truth and whose obligations include helping other people, my young people, my students, to be learners, to be truth seekers, to be lifelong learners and truth seekers, to teach them the secret that I had learned from Socrates. Don't love victory over truth. Don't fall in love with your own opinions so much that you prefer them to the truth. Don't wrap your emotions so tightly around your convictions that you become a dogmatist who cannot, because you're a dogmatist, actually seek the truth. You're not open to being challenged. You're not opening to ch open to changing your mind. And you're not open to evidence and reason and argument. I learned that the currency of intellectual discourse, the proper currency, is reasons and evidence and argument. And that you should change your position when the weight of reason on careful reflection, taking your time, thinking it through, listening to counter arguments, takes you in that direction. You need to be a servant. We all need to be servants of the truth. That has the kind of priority in our lives uh, that I, I had been unaware of prior, prior to that because I'd had an essentially instrumental conception of truth and of, of yeah. knowledge and of knowledge, of knowledge seeking. So uh, sorry about the long disquisition, but that's what I learned from Gorgias, and it came to me as a bolt out of the blue. That's really wonderful. I appreciate the insight into your background if you're sharing that with us. It resonated a lot with me with my own undergraduate experience, but also what a delight to discover that I'm not alone in the academy and indeed in political theory as also having West Virginia coal miner roots. Oh my goodness, I didn't know. And if I didn't make tenure, I would have gone on to try and make it in Nashville as a bluegrass mandolinist, which I take very seriously. So we're going to have to get together. Ryan. It's good to know there's a jam in our future. All right, but all that—that's not what. It's, it's, I'll put myself less in mind of that than uh, back to uh, our students and what might be on their minds. Um, that was really very helpful, I think, in describing the enthusiasm uh, and discovery of the joy of learning and of inquiry as a college student. I wonder if I could follow up, though, and maybe talk about a little later stage in your career, what that led to. Um, among other things, um, the fact that you are um, somewhat uniquely in the modern academy, not just only a renowned specialist who writes for specialists, but also somebody that engages with the wider public sphere. And I know that a number of our excellent students are also interested in going on to be publicly engaged scholars. So I wonder what advice you might give them as they finish their undergraduate studies in many cases and start looking forward to graduate school. What advice might you give them if they too want to participate in the broader public sphere beyond specialist inquiry? Well, Ryan, I'm asked that question a lot, I guess because I am a publicly engaged scholar and I meet so many students, not only in my own courses and at Princeton, but as I travel around the, around the country. Uh, but here I'm sort of not in the position that the students asking me the question are in. Uh, they are, in most cases, people who themselves aspire to be publicly engaged scholars. 
that was not my aspiration. In my case, it happened by accident. So I sort of can't tell you how to plan it because I didn't plan it. Um, I was doing my work, um, writing my essays, teaching my courses, working on my book, Making Men Moral, Civil Liberties and Public Morality, my first book, uh, when I arrived at Princeton in 1985 and then into the uh, early 90s. Uh, touching on issues of public uh, importance, uh, issues of public morality. That, that was really what I was interested in, the intersection of law and morality. I got interested in that in college, uh, studying philosophy and religion. Uh, and then I stuck with that interest in law school, and then I did my doctorate at Oxford on that problem, on, on the question of um, the relationship of law and morality and different kinds of natural law theories. So I was just doing that, and of course, touching on these public matters, controversial public matters, but not really being out there that much as a, as, a, as a public intellectual. I was quite young. When one day I got a phone call after the 1992 election, which, uh, as you'll recall, the sitting president, the incumbent George H.W. Bush, was defeated by the governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton. I got a call out of the blue from the presidential personnel office in the Bush administration. To this day, I don't know why I got that call or who uh, put them on to me or anything about it. I hadn't been involved in politics. Ha I voted for President Bush, um, but I hadn't given any money. I didn't have any money to give. Uh, I hadn't worked on the campaign. Uh, I didn't know anybody who was involved in the Bush campaign in New Jersey. If there was a campaign, that's not a state that Republicans ordinarily can contest, so maybe there wasn't even a campaign. But nevertheless, I got this call asking me if I would be interested in serving on the United States Commission on Civil Rights. President H.W. Uh, Bush had a, a couple of seats that he could fill uh, for six-year terms. Uh, if he filled them before the new president took office on January 20th, 1993. And since my work had touched on civil rights and civil liberties, it was, it was in the ballpark for me, that's for sure. And I thought, well, sounds interesting. Uh, I, I, I knew a bit about the Commission on Civil Rights, not a lot. It had a big profile in the 1960s and a kind of big reputation. Father Theodore Hesburgh, president of Notre Dame, was a legendary chairman of the commission during that period. And they'd done some important work, especially in the voting rights um, area. Uh, so I thought, well, that, that sounds interesting. I asked Princeton's permission to, uh, to take the, uh, the extra work, moonlighting, and Princeton said, fine, they, they welcomed their faculty doing this sort of thing. So the next thing I knew on January uh, 20th, literally on the 20th, in the morning, um, President H.W. Bush <laughs> appointed me. Uh, signed a commission dated January 20th. Uh, so I was uh, his revenge, I guess, against uh, President Clinton. And I spent six years, during which, among other things, I sued President Clinton successfully and won <laughs> uh, for an, Ill, an unlawful appointment um, that he made uh, to the staff directorship of the commission, uh, which appointment was um, uh, then uh, nullified by the court in Washington, D.C. In the, in the case that I brought. Um, but it, it got me, gave me an opportunity to be working on some practical civil rights-related uh, issues, some affirmative action uh, questions, racial preferences, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, led the commission's um, uh, inquiry into uh, the treatment of religion in American public schools. We had three hearings uh, on that as part of a program to study it and did a very nice report on that. The commission was very badly ideologically um, uh, divided, and so it was a lot of conflict. I got some real experience with politics, uh, practical politics, in, in, in doing that, but I, in part because of the lawsuit against Clinton, but, but really more because of the other things, the, the, the substantive issues I was working on, especially the religious liberty issues. Suddenly, I found myself being quoted in newspapers and being asked to write op-eds. And the next thing I knew, I was a public intellectual. I, I didn't plan to be. I, I, I had no strategy uh, for it. Um, but, but, but there it was. And then, you know, once 
once you're in it, it grows on itself. People are asking you to do this and do that and appear at this event and participate in this debate and and all, all of that. And uh, I, I was interacting with a lot of people on Capitol Hill. I was testifying frequently in the Congress. And then in 2002, I was appointed to the President's uh, Council on Bioethics. Uh, uh, Eric Cohen uh, was uh, on the staff then. He and Yuval Levin were the young superstar staff members under Leon Cast, uh, and served for not uh, uh, seven years, seven years uh, on the President's Council, first under Dr. Cast, then under Dr. Uh, Pellegrino. Uh, and of course, there was a lot of public intellectual work that came out of that. One of my books, Embryo, A Defense of Human Life, was really written as a result of um, and in response to issues that arose uh, on, the, on the commission. Um, and then uh, a few years after I went off the commission, uh, I was um, appointed to the, um, as you mentioned in your kind introduction, the um, U.S. Commission on International Religious uh, Freedom and became the chairman uh, after a year of that. Uh, and again, it meant more work in the, in the public eye, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in, in, in the public sphere where you're, you're engaging and being criticized and making points and criticizing other people and, and being in the fight. So that's how it all happened. I, I, I advised the students who asked me, how do I become a public intellectual or what, what, what should public intellectuals do or try to, try to do? I make the point, and I'll make it here, make sure that the public is secondary and the intellectual is primary. You know, we have lots of people who love the public part but don't want to do the hard work of actually being intellectuals. You know, they just want to pontificate and, and be on TV and, and, you know, write in the newspapers and get, you know, get, have, get noticed in airports and <laughs> all the stuff that comes with the territory. Uh, uh, keep the focus on your scholarship, your truth-seeking scholarship. So, so that's number one. So make sure that the public part is built on the solid foundation, the continuing solid foundation. Never give up doing intellectual work. Make sure you're doing it all the time and doing it to a high level. Second and even more important thing in some ways these days is do not become a tribalist. Do not become a hack for any party or any cause. Um, I, I think a good public intellectual, given the nature of the job, can never, while being an honest, authentic, true truth seeker, be consistently on any party's side because no party's right about everything. No, no movement is right about everything. If you're totally in line with the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the conservative movement, the progressive movement, that's probably a pretty good sign that you're being dogmatic and not being a true truth seeker. So that, that's my view of the thing. That's, I, I think that's very helpful and I, I'm sure will be appreciated by our students. And just to follow up on that, so one last question, now sort of talking about your current public engagement, um, certainly one of the things that's most striking about your public engagement, not just simply that you're a public intellectual, but a conservative public intellectual, and indeed of a particular type. Conservatives in the academy even come in all kinds of stripes, as we all know. And um, you've made, uh, uh, it seems to be very explicit overtures to reach out to those on other sides of the ideological spectrum. You referenced early on your co-teaching with uh, Professor Cornell West. Um, uh, can you tell me a little bit about how maybe that has been shaped by some of your experiences? I mean, you were referencing the ideological divides you saw in DC when working with the commission, mentioning others that are more on the side of tribalism or willing to be a party hack. Is your interest in, as it were, and these are my words, you can correct me, but reaching out to the other side, does it come from an interest in resisting some of that? It fundamentally comes from a desire for truth seeking, desire to get at the truth. Uh, to do that, you need not only to be able to challenge other people or other people's ideas, you need to be challenged, allow yourself to be challenged. So when I've been in faculty seminars and things like that, uh, which is part of the job for, for any professor uh, at a research university, um, I've, I've noticed who the faculty members are on the other side who really make me think, really make me think, whether they're challenging me directly or just making points that I am finding challenging in the general conversation. 
Now here being a conservative, I have a very distinct advantage. And that is, I'm usually the only one in the room. And I've got tons of people challenging me. If I make an argument, there'll be five people after it. <laughs> and I've got I've to try to defend it as, as best I can. Those poor folks on the other side, you know, if, if I don't happen to be in the room, nobody's, ch <laughs> nobody's challenging it, so they don't get the benefit. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons we have to fix the imbalance uh, and, and establish greater viewpoint diversity in academic life. Some of my uh, progressive colleagues actually see it that way, but, but not nearly enough of them. Most of them kind of like the, the monopoly, uh, the virtual monopoly they have, but uh, it's not good for them if they're serious truth seekers. And if they're, if they're hung up on maintaining that, a monopoly, that's a pretty good sign that they're not serious, uh, serious truth seekers. So uh, folks like Cornell West, uh, Peter Singer, uh, who disagrees with me even more, far more actually than, than Cornell West does, uh, people like that are, are people whose colleagueship I actually uh, covet. I, I, I'm grateful for it. I, I, I find it really useful uh, in trying to think things through myself. Um, I, I tell my students, um, my students all think that, you know, being Americans, having the First Amendment, being free, you know, they're entitled to their opinions. And I say, no, you're not. <laughs> of course, they're shocked and scandalized. And that's un-American and unconstitutional. <laughs> now, of course, I, I would be the first to defend anybody's opinion, no matter how ill-informed from government <laughs> Uh, coercion or anything like that. That's the last thing uh, I want. And so, yeah, you've got your right to opinion in that sense. But at least in my classes, uh, I'm not going to shove my opinion down your throat, that's for sure. And, and in fact, if you didn't know what my opinion was and you sat in on one of my classes, you probably wouldn't be able to guess. I mean, if I'm doing my job right, you wouldn't be able to guess. And my students generally tell me they wouldn't have been able to guess. Um, but if you want to have a right to an opinion in my class, you've got to earn it. And you have to earn it by not just having an opinion, but having reasons for the opinion, knowing what the reasons are. And in fact, what ultimately really entitles you to an opinion is knowing why someone as smart as you, as well-informed as you, as well-motivated as you, might nevertheless as is true on all the important issues today, come to a position different from yours. That's true whether you're on the right or the left or wherever you are. Think of any significant issue today, and there are reasonable people of goodwill, intelligent people, well-informed people who are on the other side. Now, by definition, if I'm on one side and somebody else on the other side, I think they're wrong. But I have to concede that they are reasonable people of goodwill. So I consider myself entitled to have an opinion on something when I know what led them to have the opposite opinion. And then I know why, all things considered, I still think that's wrong and that that's why I have this opinion. If I didn't think that one was wrong, I'd, I'd, I'd have that one. Instead, I have this one. So I need to know why. I need to be able to make the argument for the other position in a way that someone who held that position would regard it as a fair representation of the argument. It can't just be a straw man, a phony version of it, an easily knocked down version of it. I have to make the strongest possible argument for it and then have reasons for, for rejecting it. Yeah, that's very helpful. And um, in the spirit and with the idea that uh, healthy disagreement can lead us closer to the <laughs> truth, maybe we should turn uh, uh, to, to some of the ideas that you've uh, helpfully put forward before our students, with, especially with the essay on the baby in the bathwater. Yep. And um, I know that several of our students have questions that they wanted to ask, and I don't want to steal their fire. So I'll ask one that comes from my own interests, and I'll say that um, I've made a career out of studying Adam Smith, and I'm having a wonderful time teaching Smith to the students this uh, semester at Hertog. But it leads me to wonder about a very specific question. Um, one of the things I think your essay so helpfully does is to point out some of the challenges involved in the claim to value neutrality within contemporary liberalism and specifically in which the ways an ostensible value neutrality can sometimes be downright inimical to concerns of the human good and specifically to human flourishing. Um, to push that a little bit further though, 
one of the targets in the essay of uh, you and your co-author, um, Ryan, is um, the notion that, quote, Lockean and other forms of enlightenment liberalism are to blame. And I wonder, is it as bad as all that? Is it possible that there are resources within enlightenment liberalism that can get us close to the project that you described that I'll put very reductively and not nearly as eloquently as you do, but in terms of saving virtue amidst the contemporary concerns uh, that liberals have. Um, and I wonder specifically, you mentioned Lockean liberalism. Locke, of course, himself wrote a book on education. I've mentioned Adam Smith, who wrote long and extensively about virtue in addition to the pursuit of self-interest. So I wonder, are there resources within or different strains within even in the monolithic enlightenment tradition that might help us move in the direction that you want to move? Or do we really need to start anew and to begin to put aside some of those strands, including even the Lockeanism that's so important, of course, and foundational to our country? Good, thanks. Uh, well, I hope I never said, and if I did, I was wrong and therefore need to withdraw <laughs> and retract uh, anything that suggests that there's nothing to be learned or no value in enlightenment philosophy. Um, there is, um, uh, even in Locke, of whom I'm really quite critical, uh, or later in Mill. I mean, I've, I've, spent, I've spent much of my career being a critic of John Stuart Mill, who I think is a kind of archetypal, really founding father of, uh, of liberalism. I've been critical both of Mill's uh, utilitarianism and of his uh, libertarianism. And yet, if you look at some of my uh, recent writings, I think there's much of value in Mill, especially when it comes to the defense of freedom of thought and discussion as articulated most um, clearly and forcefully in the second chapter of Mill's famous essay uh, on liberty. So I, I don't want to banish uh, the Enlightenment philosophers or even the liberal uh, philosophers as if we've nothing to learn from them. And you're certainly right that there are different strands of Enlightenment philosophy. Uh, I myself have drawn, and, and this is true of Smith, on, uh, in, in the case of Smith as well, have drawn to a pretty considerable extent when I think back on my writings on leading Scottish Enlightenment philosophers, both engaging with them and sometimes borrowing uh, from them. Uh, even Hume, of whom I've been a critic. Now, I know, that, I know Hume's technically Scottish, but the, the, the Scots think of him as, Eng as English. Uh, uh, but uh, even in the case of Hume, I mean, a lot of my own work has been advanced by engaging with him. And his ideas are powerful, even though in most cases on the issues that I'm concerned about, uh, I think he's wrong. So I don't... I, I don't th want to say there's nothing to learn from uh, from the Enlightenment. Uh, uh, take Hume, for example. The critique of bad arguments for moral objectivity that you have in Hume is really powerful. For example, the distinction between what is the case and what ought to be, the so-called fact-value distinction, is real. That's for real. And Hume was right to press that against Clark and some of the other people that he made the argument against. Now, he believed that that, together with some other considerations, or those together with other considerations, uh, leads to the proposition that he was willing to embrace. Reason is and not only to be the slave of the passions and may pretend to no office other than to serve and obey them, to essentially in a subjective conception of, um, of uh, reason, an instrumental conception of practical reason and a desire-based theory of human uh, motivation. Um, I think that's wrong. But I can think that's wrong while still valuing the useful critique of bad arguments for positions that I think are right. And he does provide those. Uh, and it's not just been with um, uh, in, in the mode of criticism, like engaging with Mill or with Hume critically. Um, I've drawn on Reed. Uh, I've drawn on Adam Smith affirmatively in some of my work. I think they're right about stuff. I, I, I don't think it's all just, just plain wrong. That's also true of Locke, although Locke's a very complicated case. I think there's a lot of inconsistency in the corpus of, 
of of Locke. I I I think there's th th this would get us into some big issues that I'd love to talk with you about sometime. Uh, um, there's a kind of legacy of Athens and Jerusalem in Locke that informs some of the best stuff, like some of what he says about education, that I think competes with a sort of philosophical empiricism, which is not consistent with Athens and Jerusalem or with a Judeo-Christian uh, and classical uh, ethic, which is, I think, where Locke took a certain strand of liberalism off in the wrong direction, the strand that ends up in the, I think, rather spectacular uh, and in its own way, magnificent failure of the thought of John Rawls. There's something I'd be happy to go into if you want to uh, uh, go. And, and I know that, that some of our students want to move in that direction as well. A couple of them I know have questions about uh, Rawls among others um, and who want to continue this conversation. There, there's so much I want to follow up on, but I know that the students are waiting patiently here. So I think in the interest of time and the interest of deepening the discussion, and they will be focusing specifically on the essay. So it'll give a chance, I think, to discuss a little bit more about these themes in contemporary liberalism from Baby in the Bathwater. Let me, if we can, um, get our first of our pre-submitted questioners on the line. I believe uh, first in order is Pierce Gillen from, uh, from Baylor University. Uh, Baylor. If Pierce, you're on the line and you're ready to give your question, we're ready to hear it. Hi, Pierce. Hi, Professor Hanley, Professor George. Uh, thank you for speaking with us this evening. Uh, Professor George, uh, in the essay that uh, Professor Hanley just mentioned, you criticize a sort of Lockean and liberal regime that purports to be neutral on the question of the good, uh, but you argue that specific liberal institutions can be salvaged if they're shown to be conducive to that good. However, historically, it seems that in large part, the cause and appeal of such neutral regimes was that people could not agree on the good, and especially on how that good intersected with religion post-Reformation. So to avoid all that conflict and resulting bloodshed, they settled on such neutral regimes that pursue supposedly non-controversial goods like peace and economic prosperity. So how do we build a polity around a conception of the good while on the one hand avoiding false neutrality, but on the other hand avoiding violent disagreement? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the account that you've uh, represented there for us is the standard account that tends to be given by contemporary liberal thinkers of the history of how we got to the institutions that even non-liberals like me uh, think are good institutions and are prepared to defend. Uh, I actually don't think that's faithful to the history. It's not as if it's just straight out false, but I, I, I think it's, uh, it's much more complicated uh, than that and less straightforwardly a matter of people couldn't agree on the good and therefore they decided to stop fighting each other about it and create neutrality. I just don't think that's true to the historical facts. And, you know, there are various uh, historical writings that, that I would uh, uh, point you to uh, that contest that picture. But whatever account of the history uh, we might give, this is what I would like to say. We have very good, prof uh, Professor Hanley will know what I mean by this term, perfectionist reasons substantive moral reasons for affirming so-called liberal values. And I don't care about the label. I'm happy to call them liberal values. That's what you like. We have perfectly good perfectionist, substantive moral reasons for uh, holding liberal values like freedom of speech, the free exercise of religion, uh, the right of assembly, due process of law, equal protection. Uh, in fact, I think those values and principles can be defended more credibly on a perfectionist substantive moral account than they can be uh, on the standard liberal picture. Here, I think Mill was right in a way that contemporary liberals are wrong. Mill did not suppose that the way to defend liberal values or even understand liberal values or the basis of liberal values was in um, uh, what he called abstract right. Think of Rawls, for example. No, he said uh, it's utility. It's, it's the substantive good. Now, Mill and I have a big dispute about utilitarianism, but we agree that the reason we should honor freedom of speech is that it serves important substantive values 
not on the basis of some social contract or deal or original position decision or anything like that, where we agree to, I let you speak and you let me speak. Um, and so we don't fight all the time. We, we, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll not coerce you and you won't coerce me. I, I think Mills hit the nail on the head here. Take, take freedom of speech. Uh, while it serves many important substantive values, there's one that it does preeminently, and that's the pursuit of truth. That's very relevant, especially to the scholarly and intellectual and educational enterprises. But it's also true with respect to running a democratic republic or any kind of decent government where communications among the people and of the people with their rulers is all things considered uh, likely to tend toward better government than the opposite would, uh, would, would permit. So it's on that basis, that substantive moral or, or so-called perfectionist basis that I think we can best, most plausibly, most powerfully uh, protect uh, these sorts of values. Is that, is that responsive, Pierce, to your, to your question? Absolutely, it's given me a lot to think about, thank you. We actually have, thanks Pierce very much for your question. And we have, uh, among our questioners, we have another question. It's actually very closely related. I wonder if I could ask Laura Murray of the University of Colorado Boulder to follow with her question, which also raises a, a uh, directly. Hi, Dr. George. Um, thank I you guys for hearing me. Sideways on my, uh... <laughs> there we go. I was trying to make myself wide, but I guess it didn't work. Um, well, thank you for speaking with us, with us today. I've really in, enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, so in the final lines of your essay, The Baby in the Bathwater, you stated that our liberal institutions deserve better than to be simply dismissed a priori um, based on abstractions, that they deserve to be admired, which um, when they enable the common good and improved on, or in some cases replaced when they don't. And I'm curious which institutions you believe are doing the best for the common good in our current moment, and which institutions are most in need of improvement or replacement? Okay, good. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate it. Um, I, uh, we're not doing very well, I think, institutionally or otherwise in upholding the common good today. Th that's not a shocking statement. Uh, Americans are very badly polarized. There's bad behavior across a pretty broad spectrum. Uh, it's it's probably not news to you that I'm critical of the President of the United States. I'm also critical of the Democrats. Um, I'm critical of the rioters in the in the streets. Uh, I'm critical of the alt-right idiots who sent me uh, who send me images of their frog uh, and 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 uh, say yeah. terrible, dreadful, racist, and other things. Um, so I, I don't think we're doing all that well. But I think there are some institutions that do well when we honor them that are sometimes thought of as liberal institutions. And again, the label doesn't matter to me. Separation of powers, I think, is a good one. I think limited government of the sort that we try to, or that our founders tried to ensure by dividing, by the system of federalism, which is another good institution, <laughs> dividing uh, power between a central government that's a government of delegated and enumerated powers and states that function as governments of general jurisdiction exercising plenary authority in, in the legal culture referred to as police powers to protect public health, safety, and morals and advance the, the common good. I think the Madisonian system of our Constitution uh, is a really good set of, quote, liberal institutions <laughs> Uh, and our problem where we've gone wrong is in dishonoring and in, in, in failing to live by and live up to those and compromising those. The branches of government do not stay within their lanes. They do not color within the proper lines. There's been a tremendous erosion of legislative power to the executive branch on the one side and to the judicial branch on the other side. Or put another way, the, both the judiciary and the executive have been for decades usurping the authority vested by the Constitution in the people's representatives in the Congress, just to speak of the, the federal level. It's interesting, the most, I think the most important word and most neglected word in the entire Constitution is the first word of the first sentence 
of the first paragraph of the first article of the Constitution. It's the word all, A-L-L. -L. It was very deliberately chosen. All legislative power shall be vested uh, under, the, under the United States. All legislative power shall be vested in the Congress. That means the court's not supposed to have any. The executive's not supposed to have any. What is it about all that judges don't seem to be able to understand and presidents don't be, of either party, don't seem to be able to understand, and that Congress itself doesn't understand since it simply yields its authority to the judiciary on the one hand and the executive on the other. So I think these are good institutions that are, are not functioning for us well because we are not adhering to them. We are not demanding them. And we, the people, because we have not been, been true to Madison's uh, 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 warning to us that only a well-educated people can permanently be a free people. Because we haven't been true to that and because we are not a well-educated people, our people are allowing this to happen. Ultimately, the protectors of the Constitution are the people themselves, not the judges. They'll abuse it. And it's certainly not politicians. It's got to be the people themselves. We need to insist that the courts stay in their lane, the executive stays in its lane, and Congress does its job of legislating. Now, I'm, I'm saying this in full awareness that there will be gray areas. Even if we were doing this right, there are gray areas. It's sometimes not clear whether you're on the legislative or executive side of the line. Sometimes there are close cases about when the judiciary should and shouldn't intervene under the Constitution to disrupt or displace a legislative uh, uh, settlement. That's fine. But we're not talking about gray area cases here in the main. We're talking about gross, obvious uh, violations of the separation of power. Same with the principle of, of, uh, of federalism. Uh, and then there's been, you know, similar corruption when it comes to principles such as uh, such as civil liberties, things being read to mean what they don't mean, uh, law being rewritten by courts under the pretext of uh, of applying it as written, uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of abuses. And in the end, I think this will go on until we, the people, stand up and say. You know, we're going to fix this and we're not going to tolerate it. We're going to vote people out of office if they don't behave them, themselves. The alternative, I think, uh, is not a happy one. And that is where we don't correct the system and the system falls into disrepute. It simply becomes dysfunctional. And then you have, you know, ultimately some either um, relatively tame or quite untamed form of tyranny. That's what the founders worried about. They, they knew, Laura, that what they gave us was an experiment. They called it an experiment. Read the Federalist Papers. They called it an experiment. Experiments by their nature can fail. Republican government had always failed everywhere else from the ancient world on, on forward. So they, uh, uh, they knew that it would only be preserved if we ourselves insisted that the public officials, whether they're jurists or legislators or presidents and governors and sheriffs, actually live under the Constitution. Thank you both uh, for the answer and Laura for your question. Um, Thank you very much. We've got uh, several other questions in the queue. Um, a very interesting one about another recent piece. Um, this one of Adrian Vermeule's. Uh, this is from James Beckwith of St. John's College, Annapolis. James, are you there? Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to ask, um, in his recent piece in The Atlantic, Professor Adrian Vermeule has argued for using institutions of the state, specifically the Supreme Court, to advance an integralist vision of what the United States should be in opposition to liberalism. Is Professor Vermeule correct that liberalism is inherently self-undermining and thus susceptible to challenges like this? Or are there resources within liberalism that allow for a stronger response to these challenges? Okay, good. Thank you, James. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm intimidated to be talking to a Johnny, a uh, St. John student. Uh, uh, they know stuff, and that's really impressive. Uh, when, I, when I was a high school senior, I remember getting some literature from uh, St. John's uh, College, and I looked at it and saw the Great Books program. I didn't know, any, even recognize the names of these people. 
Euripides. I mean, what would I know about Euripides? But, but I thought, wow, this is really cool. I should apply there. Uh, and then I got scared. I thought, oh, wow, that's, that sounds really hard. That's too hard. So I, I, I didn't end up, uh, end up applying. But uh, of course, I've since met uh, many graduates uh, and students currently at, at St. John's. What a place. What a great program. Okay, so uh, Professor Vermeule is a good friend of mine. He and I teach together. I've taught together twice at, at, uh, at Harvard. Uh, he uh, is a recent Catholic convert. I'm a, I'm a born Catholic. Uh, so we, we, we have that uh, in common. He identifies with something called integralism, which is an internal Catholic uh, idea that um, is distinguished from the kind of Catholicism that I represent, uh, sometimes called Vatican II Catholicism. <laughs> Um, uh, Vatican II, I think, is sometimes claimed by liberal Catholics, but they, they, they're wrong to claim it. It's, it's not theirs, it's mine. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but Vatican II uh, Catholicism um, stresses the importance the church is embracing of religious liberty and of uh, fellowship and, um, and uh, uh, cooperation with people of other faiths with Protestants, Jews, Muslims, uh, Buddhists, and, and so forth, recognizing much that's valuable in the other traditions. Integralists are sort of less sympathetic to that ecumenical and interfaith uh, project, and they're a little more skeptical or have a narrower view of uh, the proper role of religious freedom. They want a little tighter, sometimes in some cases a lot tighter, relationship between, between church and state. One of those, quote, liberal principles um, that, uh, that I believe in uh, is that there should be uh, a separate secular, um, uh, not secularist, that's an ideology, uh, secular in the literal sense and religious sphere. I, I don't think that public officials should ever hold office in virtue of ecclesiastical appointment or that ecclesiastical officers should ever hold office in virtue of political appointment. So that's the difference between integralists and a conservative Catholic like, like me. Um, on liberalism and Adrian's view on liberalism, we'll have to see as his work uh, emerges uh, more clearly what he means by it. I think I agree with a lot of uh, what he says, and I don't think you have to be an integralist, although integralism itself, I'm, you know, I, 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 want, I need more clarity there too, but, but they're working on it, and the stuff's coming out, and it's just not just Adrian. There are other really smart people who are working on that, uh, um, uh, Edmund Waldstein, uh, Gladden Papa, and there are a number of people. They've, they've got a, a, a journal that's pumping out interesting uh, stuff. But I do need to know more about what liberalism means. Now, I do think liberalism of the anti-perfectionist sort, the sort that claims neutrality or that the, that the proper guiding principle for law in the state should be neutrality with respect to questions of what makes for or detracts from a valuable and morally worthy way of life. I think that is self-defeating, incoherent, and that kind of uh, so-called neutrality is actually an illusion. And worse than an illusion, it masks a substantive secular progressive vision that competes with uh, the 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 substantive the competing substantive visions that liberalism wants to rule out of out of bounds, uh, the perfectionist uh, visions. Uh, I've likened it to um, a baseball pitcher uh, who um, uh, suddenly declares himself to be the umpire and starts throwing his pitches, and suddenly you know twenty seven batters. Are, 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 are struck out on uh, pitches that are called strikes that are, you know, three feet beyond the reach of the bat. Uh, this, is, this is not fair. This is not neutrality. Uh, so if, if that's what is meant by liberalism, yeah. But if by liberalism we mean the principles of the American founding, we mean the uh, structural uh, components of the Constitution, separation of powers, uh, federalism, national government is government of delegated and enumerated powers, civil liberties principles like the free exercise of religion, um, some, uh, not the liberal version, not the, not, the, not the ACLU's version of separation of church and state, but the separations of the, of the uh, uh, temporal and uh, spiritual spheres, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly, 
all those things, yeah, I'm, I'm for those. I think those have to be defended, but shouldn't be defended, as my answer to the previous question I think should have made clear, shouldn't be defended on liberal neutralist grounds, but rather on substantive moral grounds. We need to make the case for them as contributing to, as necessary for the flourishing of human beings. Why should we defend freedom? We should defend freedom because freedom is a condition of any human being's flourishing. An unfree person cannot flourish. Now, it's also necessary to the flourishing of human beings that there be restraints on freedom. And those restraints have to go beyond, I think, where, where the most extreme forms of libertarianism would place them at just preventing coercion and deception. Uh, I think there's a substantive common good that can and should be advanced, but subject to principles, including the principle of subsidiarity, which requires that decisions that can be made by private initiative and authority, by individuals, by families, by what Tocqueville called the institutions of civil society, what Burke called the little platoons, that those decisions should be made there and not by government. Families should be the primary institution responsible for health, education, and welfare, not government. Families should be primarily responsible for transmitting the values and virtues that are necessary for people to lead successful lives and be good citizens, not government. But where government can't, I'm sorry, where private initiative and families and churches and so forth can't accomplish what needs to be accomplished or can't accomplish it well, then we kick it up to government. But even there, under the principle of subsidiarity, it should be the lowest level of government, the government nearest the people, most under their control, most accountable to them, most responsible, the ones that they can most easily remove <laughs> that makes the decision, leaving only the decisions that require uh, uh, decision making at higher level, resolution at higher levels, to be made by those higher levels. So I like the idea of a very limited national government bit more power uh, for the states and the municipal governments, but leaving as much as we responsibly can to families and churches and so forth. Not just for the sake of individual rights. One of the things that uh, I think Adrian and I share, we actually share many beliefs. Um, uh, one of the things we share is the belief that it, it depicts the political theory question wrong to suppose that there are two players, the individual and the state. There are actually three. There's the individual, there's civil society, and there's the state. The institutions of civil society, families, churches, civic associations, and so forth, those are what Mary Ann Glendon and others call the mediating institutions between the individual and the state. They provide, among other things, a sort of buffer. They help to preserve individual liberty, but they're also worth preserving for their own sake, for the sake of the human goods that it is possible for us to achieve well because there are communities, private, small communities, in which we achieve them. Great. Thank you, James, for that question. Thank you. Um, we've had, uh, we're getting close on the hour here, and uh, we have a long queue of excellent questions, and I'm afraid I'm sure we're not going to be able to get to them all, but hopefully if we're keeping the questions short, we'll be able to get at least through the next few. Um, so with that, I wonder if I could ask uh, Vienna Scott of Yale University to pose her question. Hi, Vienna. Hello. Um, so, so it was so wonderful to hear you responding to the previous questions. And I think I'm going to diverge a little bit from your article. Um, I'm most interested in your friendship with Cornell West. It's become quite famous. <laughs> I think he even held Harriet Tubman's Bible for you to swear in on at the Supreme Court uh, when you were sworn in as the chairman of the International Religious Freedom Commission. Um, and and that, in, in, in that incident alone captures that intense kind of religious, political, and public connection that the two of you have. Um, and while you famously disagree on quite a lot, you both speak together in support of this truth-seeking and examined life. Um, and the point of that examined life is to be challenged and to be made uncomfortable in your kind of static beliefs. Uh, so what parts of Cornell West worldview have challenged you the most and how has he made you a better scholar or person? Oh, wonderful question. Thank you, Vienna. Uh, well, first, let me tell you the story. I can't resist. I know we don't have much time. I'll try to tell it compactly and economically. <laughs> tell you the story of the swearing in. 
so when I was elected chairman of the U.S. Commission on, Indiv on um, International Religious Freedom, I wanted to be sworn in. I was going to be sworn in by Chief Justice Roberts. I wanted to be sworn in on a, an important Bible. Now, all Bibles are important, but I wanted it to be a historically significant Bible. I, I thought, you know, it'd be nice to be sworn on a Bible of a true human rights hero. So I started combing my mind about who my heroes are, you know, Frederick Douglass and uh, Winston Churchill. The, well, I thought uh, Harriet Tubman. Now, now there's an admirable woman in so many ways, and I'm sure she had a Bible. Now I'm trying to figure out where is it. So I go online this, this day and age, you can figure things like that out. And, I, and I'm, I've, I learn that Harriet Tubman's Bible is at the Harriet Tubman House in Auburn, New York on the, on the railroad, on the Underground Railroad. It's a little, uh, a little museum, essentially, uh, dedicated to Harriet Tubman. Uh, so I, I got on the phone and called people there. They were delighted to hear from me. I mean, not enough people. Were, the movie, of course, was, wasn't out. There was no one. And, and it turns out they don't get much attention. Uh, Harriet Tubman was not well known. So they were just thrilled that I called and was interested in Harriet Tubman and wanted to borrow her Bible. So they very kindly arranged, and it was complicated because, you know, it's a historical artifact, had to be insured and, you know, sent by FedEx and, you know, there had to be somebody right there to collect it and the whole, the whole thing. But they made all the arrangements for the Bible to get to me. And of course, I wanted my beloved friend and teaching partner, Cornell West, to hold the Bible, and he kindly agreed to do that. So on the appointed day, we arrived in Washington, D.C., and I had that. It's a big Bible. It's a great, you, you, if you see a picture of it, you, you won't believe how large the Bible is. So I had it under my, uh, under my arm. And Cornell and I walked up the steps of the Marble Temple to go into the Supreme Court building on the side entrance. So we walk, walk up the steps, and we get to this, this plateau area, this level area. Um, and we're walking by this couple of police officers. And I see... Cornell catch the eye of one of the police officers and the two of them give each other a kind of suspicious look. And I, I didn't say anything. I waited until we were out of earshot and I said, Cornell, what, what was that look with the police officer? And he said, well, Brother Robbie, that's the officer who arrested me last time I was down here at the Supreme Court for a demonstration. And he said, yeah, come to think of it, this is the first time I've ever been to the Supreme Court when I wasn't here to get arrested. <laughs> so, so in we went, and uh, Chief Justice received us both very, very uh, warmly, and we had a lovely uh, swearing-in ceremony. My parents and other members of my family uh, were there as well as, as well as Cornell. Yeah, okay, so we've taught together, and we've, we've traveled the country together, and, you know, we've engaged each other, and we have a lot in common, uh, Christian faith. Uh, he's on the Protestant side, I'm on the Catholic side, we shared Christian faith, and we have interest in a lot of the same uh, 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 philosophical uh, uh, writers, uh, and in some cases, novelists and, and, and poets and others. Um, uh, so you know, we have a lot to agree on, but we also just, he's head of Democrat, he's honorary chairman of Democratic Socialists of America. He's a Bernie Sanders guy. I'm not any of that. Um, but, you know, we, we've had wonderful opportunities to engage. He's a great teacher, by the way. When we're teaching together, he, he's, he's fabulous with the students. He challenges the students on the left every bit as much as he does on the right, which is what I try to do with my students on the right every bit as much as on the on the left. So we're completely simpatico and we, we found a certain magic in the classroom. We, from the very first moment we were teaching, the very first time we ever taught together, very first class, very first moments, we could tell that there was this chemistry there and this, this, this magic. And so we, uh, you know, we do it whenever, whenever we can. Where he has most um, influenced my own thinking is on issues of race, which maybe isn't so uh, surprising. You know, like a lot of uh, conservatives, my uh, impulse is to think the problem with race is that people think about it and talk about it too much. People are too race conscious. You know, if we would just cut that out, everything would be okay, or at least it'd be better. Can we just stop talking about race and dividing ourselves up by race and thinking of ourselves as white and black and Asian and, and whatever? Now, that's not a bad impulse. It's a good one. And there's even truth in it. And yet what I've learned from Cornell is that 
in the American experience, race is connected to culture. And historically, the history of slavery and segregation and Jim Crow and persecution and impression and uh, 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 violations of rights has been integrated into the development of African American culture, understandings, expectations, literature, music, art. So just as we can speak of a Jewish culture, for example, we can speak of an African American or black American historical culture. And it, it, like Jewish culture, that's a culture that people can rightly take pride in and feel a kinship with. Now that doesn't mean that Duke Ellington belongs more to Cornell than me, any more than Shakespeare belongs me to, more to me than Cornell. But it is a tradition, a, uh, a, a culture. Uh, it, it should not be a source of tribalism. Race should not be a source of tribalism. I still don't think preferences based on race and admissions or hiring or uh, uh, contract, government contracting is a good idea. I think it's actually a bad idea. I think that in, in most areas of life, certainly in public political life, uh, legal in our legal system, color blindness is the is the way to go. But the idea that uh, someone like Cornell identifies with uh, a certain culture, he referred to himself as coming from a people who has produced these cultural achievements: James Baldwin, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Ellington, uh, 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 W. B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass. That's, that's important, that's significant, that's okay, and it's not wrong, all right? So I'm much more open than I was before engaging with these issues, uh, on these issues with Cornell, to understanding and even appreciating within limits racial consciousness for groups like African Americans. In the same way I appreciate it for Jews. There's a, re it, there's a reason it makes sense to have a Jewish studies department. There's a whole culture and tradition of learning, of, uh, of uh, philosophy, of theology, of literature. And Jews identify. I'm, I'm married into a Jewish family. My, my in-laws understand and appreciate that. And that's not bad. That doesn't mean they're hyphenated Americans, or they're not really Americans. They have dual loyalties, or they're not really dedicated to the country or, or, or anything, uh, anything like that. So I think to get the race issue right, which the urgency of which is now just really obvious that we've got to get this right, uh, on the one hand, we have to avoid the racializing of things and the race hustling and the grievance mongering and all that stuff. I'm, I'm as against that as I ever was. But I think we cannot simply dismiss the idea that there's a legitimate domain for race consciousness or racial consciousness. So there you are, Vienna. Does that, uh, you don't have to agree with me, but did, did I answered your question? No, that's great. I mean, the question was, in what ways has he challenged you and in what ways have you grown? So that's a great answer. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Vienna. And uh, we don't want to take up too much more of Professor George's time. So with apologies to all those that have been waiting in the queue, let's squeeze one last question in if we could. Uh, I believe our last questioner tonight will be, um, I believe we have a question from Grace Van Jones of Annapolis, Maryland. Maybe also a Johnny, perhaps? Yes, I'm also a Johnny, and I hope I'm mm -hmm. half as intimidating as James. Um, my question has to do with the liberal tendency, the progressive liberal tendency to stifle the sort of politically incorrect speech and thereby to encourage conformism, as mentioned in your article. It's an unfortunate extreme, but it seems to me that it's come to be as a result of another extreme which dominated in the past, that of a tendency to degrade minority groups both in speech and in action and to stifle alternative modes of thought. So my question is this, how can we overcome the irony of silencing speech in the name of inclusivity 
while still fostering a dialogue that includes respect and recognition of diversity. Oh, thank you, Grace. Thank you. Uh, here I have um, a difference of opinion with some people with whom I'm otherwise uh, very simpatico. I have in mind my great friend, the wonderful historian, uh, Ryan, you'll recognize the name, Alan Kors from the University of Pennsylvania. Alan and I have actually debated this question on, uh, on NPR. <laughs> um, so some people think that there's something in the ideology of progressivism or the left itself that is in the end just uh, um, incompatible with freedom of thought and expression. As much as the early liberals like Mill uh, promoted those ideas, the theory that Allen has, for example, is that as liberal or left ideology has developed, it's, what's baked into it is an intolerance of dissent, an intolerance of competing opinions. And that manifests itself, Alan thinks now, because you know the universities are dominated by people on the left, as are most of the institutions of culture. David, David Brooks is right when he says that the left has a cultural monopoly. That's true. Cultural power is entirely in the hands of, of, of the left. What the right has, if it, when it has it, is some measure of political power. But much of the time, as in the Obama years, you don't even have that. So then the left has a complete <laughs> uh, monopoly. Um, so uh, that, that's Alan's account of it. And I think that's the standard conservative account. I think most conservatives would agree with, uh, with Alan. I don't agree. I think the problem is not a leftist problem or a progressivism problem or anything like that. I think it's a human nature problem. I think the problem is original sin. I think human beings naturally, for all our good qualities, <laughs> Uh, have some bad ones. And one of those is we don't like to be disagreed with. We don't like to be contradicted. We need to train ourselves to accept contradiction by understanding the value of being challenged. And, and, and that's an effort. That's, that's hard. Not everybody, not everybody gets there. So I think as a result of that, whenever you have a monopoly on cultural power, you're going to get intolerance of other people's points of view. And if the right were in the same position, say, in the universities that the left is, if, if Cornell were as lonely in the current academic world as I am, the people on my side would, I think, be just as intolerant as, of his speech as the people who are currently in charge are scandalized by and, and you know, would like if they could to shut down, shut down my, my speech. So maybe this goes back, Grace, to your point, although I think historically it's complicated, but it could be that, you know, there was a time when a different element with a different ideology uh, had the sort of cultural monopoly and they behaved the way the left is behaving today. They're clamping down on other people and uh, intolerant of, 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 of dissent. Um, I mean, the Catholic Church took a long time to get to the Vatican II type position. I mean, the seeds of it were always there. The, the record is complicated historically, actually. But for a long time, the dominant view among churchmen was error has no rights. So yeah, you know, you, there, are good, there are prudential reasons you have to tolerate other religions and prudential reasons that you have to tolerate um, uh, speech, even when the speech tends to um, uh, lead people astray and so forth. But they're just, they're not principled reasons. The, the modern development of Catholic teaching is in the direction of the, quote, liberal direction of uh, thinking there are principled reasons for uh, respecting these freedoms. And, and I think that's right, and I'm glad the church has gone in that direction. I'm happy to be taught uh, that by uh, my church. Uh, but the liberal church uh, has uh, not gone in that direction, <laughs> or the progressive, the left-wing church uh, has gone in the direction of... Um, of uh, not being so tolerant of speech. And that makes Cornell West a heretic in his faith. Uh, now, actually, his real faith is the Christian faith. But uh, among uh, folks on the left, he stands out as someone who is 100% for uh, freedom of thought and uh, expression. And for the right reasons, uh, truth-seeking in universities and the maintenance of Republican democracy. So if you go back to 2017, you can find a statement that Cornell and I put out called Truth-Seeking Democracy and Freedom of Thought and Expression. 
And we were, despite our differences, two peas in a pod, we were, we were joined at the hip, uh, not only in the principal defense of basic civil liberties, but in our reasoning for the defense. Grace, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, evade any aspect of your question, so I'd like you to come back if there's anything in my answer that you would like me to clarify or expand on. Well, I think this is one of the more helpful responses um, that I've gotten for this question. I guess maybe in the interest of time, it's not best to ask this, but I know you said it's historically complicated. Um, I wonder if you'd be willing to share any element of the historical complication <laughs> of oh, sure. this. Uh, just very, yeah, very, very quickly, I, I, was, I was saying that the story of the Catholic Church's development of its teaching is complicated. So you can go back all the way to the early church and you will find among important, Tertullian, important figures a pretty robust defense of religious freedom, that religion can't be imposed because the nature of faith is such that it can't be faith if it's imposed. A coerced faith is no faith at all. You can coerce the outward acts of faith, but not the inward uh, acts of will and intellect that make the faith an actual faith, an act of faith. You're just getting inauthenticity. In inauthenticity. Uh, and people are behaving, they're going to church or they're saying the rosary or they're doing whatever you're, trying, you're forcing them to do, but not as an expression or the outward manifestation of faith, which is an inward uh, thing. All the way up through the 19th century, and 19th century popes were pretty critical of some quote, liberal ideas like freedom of religion, but you find a figure, a very orthodox Catholic, Cardinal Newman, great convert from the Anglican church to, uh, to Catholicism, uh, who's making a very robust defense of uh, religious freedom and uh, freedom of thought and, and expression. Uh, for example, in his letter to the, uh, to the Duke of Norfolk, which is a wonderful, it's about 1872, as I recall, wonderful defense of the rights of conscience, including the rights of what he believed to be an erring conscience. Uh, so someone who, uh, who not only uh, resists the church, but actively opposes the church. What matters there is, and what deserves respect and, and, and can't be dishonored is the conscientious, the, the conscience-based nature of the view and the objection, even if, from Newman's view, the substance of the view is, is wrong. These are the resources being drawn on by Vatican II, by the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, in formally developing the church's teaching in this area and making it doctrine, which you get in documents uh, called Dignitatis Humanae and Nostra Aetate. So the story is not the conventional one that progressives will uh, so often tell you. It's all about Galileo and the Inquisition, and, all, and although even those are complicated stories. Um, but you, you get the basic you got the basic picture. So the, this this has been a debate that's been going on within uh, Catholicism, as it has been within other uh, traditions as well. Actually, uh, for in the case of Catholicism, a couple of thousand uh, a thousand couple of thousand years. So that's what I meant when I said the story is more complicated than what you're likely to get in some PBS docudrama or something. It's fascinating. I'll have to stifle my my rising questions as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Grace, for that question. Indeed, all our questions. And thank you especially, Professor George. It's really been a joy as it's been a wonderful conversation. Usually I'd invite a, for a round of applause, but I suppose it's incumbent upon me just on behalf of all the students and the staff at her talk. Thank you so much for taking time to, to join with us. My here. great pleasure, Ryan. I, I appreciate the invitation and thanks to everyone who participated.